seems like folks are able to get in. I hope everybody's audio and if you're joining us via video are working just fine. Um, thank you. Like I mentioned at the beginning, this is our second Enviro House workshop. Today we're going to be talking about um, water-wise, natural yard care. Um, I'll let uh, Janda do some introductions in a moment of who's on our, on our panel. Um, but I did want to say thank you for joining us. I know I can speak for those of us at the city of Tacoma that we have all become very familiar with the city of doing virtual workshops and meetings over the last three months. But for some of you on this call, this may be your very first time in the last few months or ever that you've had the opportunity to join uh, one of these virtual workshops. So welcome. Um, I'm going to let uh, Janda do some introductions and then before we get started, I'm going to run through just a couple quick technical logistical notes on how uh, this Zoom meeting is going to work and how the workshop is going to function. So um, for now, I'm going to hand it over to Jan to do some intros and then she'll hand it back to me. Thank you and welcome as, uh, <laughs> did you send that plane my way? Yeah. It's now going over my <laughs> own. Are you in the same flight path? <laughs> I must be. Um, so welcome to um, our second EnviroHouse virtual workshop. We will be having another one July 1st and we'll tell you about that at the end of the program. Um, I'm Janda, I'm the coordinator at the Enviro House um, and hope to get back there soon. We are joined today by Natalie Jones and Rochelle Ganderud and um, they are both representing Tacoma Water and they will be bringing you a clear understanding of water wise natural yard care. Um, this is a really good workshop, we've presented it before and um, Natalie has updated it and added some new things. So we're looking forward to that. You've met Leah, who is our mastermind behind all of the Zoom magic. I wanted to refer to it as Oz, but that's kind of been <laughs> behind the curtain. Behind or the curtain is, he's, he's a little bit not as upfront. <laughs> um, so many thanks to uh, Leah for corralling everybody and helping us to make this work. We appreciate that. Um, and as she said, she will be going through the Q&A process and um, the polling questions and some different things. Um, Leo information at the end about our next workshop and when that will get up so you can sign up for that if you're interested. The topic will be um, <clears throat> planting and using and preserving herbs. So that looks to be a good one. Um, we are also doing, um, while I have the floor here, we are also doing more how-to videos. We are adding three or four more this month. So do check if you haven't seen them, YouTube, our EnviroHouse how-to videos, which are a little shorter, but they have a lot of um, really good information on gardening and different kinds of um, topics that are of interest. So thanks again for joining us and um, back to you, Leah. Thank you, Janda. So just real quickly, like I mentioned, um, this may be your first Zoom meeting altogether, but it may be the first Zoom webinar that some of you have participated in. So you might have noticed if you're an attendee, um, we can't hear you audibly and we can't see your video. That's one of the features of um, this webinar meeting. So um, we will have an opportunity later in this conversation to um, uh, unmute you and you can ask questions of our panelists verbally so keep that in mind but um, for now I see we've got about 25 folks on the call that are either listening in on the phone or watching us via video on their computers um, but regardless of where you're participating from um, there are a couple of features that I think will be really helpful and we want to make this as interactive an experience as possible for everybody so um, if you look down at the bottom of your screen or hover your mouse or touch your screen um, you should see a couple of buttons down at the bottom if you have a question at any time during um, this presentation for Natalie or myself or Janda, um, please use the Q&A button. Um, that'll let us keep track of all the questions that are coming in and make sure that we do our best to answer everybody's questions in real time. Um, if you have a question or you just want to pose a comment to the rest of the group and attendees, you can use the chat feature. That's really handy. Um, click the chat button and you should see a window pop up where you can chat with all other um, attendees and panelists. Now I do want to mention um, sometimes on Zoom, you'll notice when you click the chat button and over on the bottom right hand side of your screen, you can either send a chat message to all panelists, meaning myself, Natalie and Janda and Rochelle are the only ones that will see your chat message, or you can send a chat to the entire attendee list. Now, I want these EnviroHouse workshops, and I know I speak for Janda too, when we say we want these to be um, really community building experience and we wanna share dialogue amongst each other. So I really encourage you to use that chat feature to chat amongst yourselves um, and with, 
the entire attendee list. Sometimes Zoom defaults so that we're the only ones to see it, but use that little drop down menu in the bottom right hand corner of your screen to make sure you're sending your chats to all panelists and attendees so all of us can see it. Um, lastly, I do want to mention that we're going to be doing a couple of interactive polls throughout this workshop. Now to show you how that works, I'm going to do a poll right now. Um, because we're always interested in hearing where uh, people came from and what brought them here, you'll notice on your screen here in just a moment, a poll should pop up. Um, we wanna know what brought you here today. How did you hear about this workshop? Did you hear about it in an email, on a website, in a Facebook post? Um, please take a quick minute. We'll leave this up here for about 30 seconds for you to answer and um, let us know what brought you here today. So if for some reason you're unable to answer, or the, the poll isn't working for you, you can always put your answer in the chat as well. So it looks like we've got about 65% of folks that have voted and participated and that number is climbing. So we'll leave it on here for a few more seconds. This is just to give you an opportunity to see um, what the poll looks like, how it is gonna kind of incorporate into this workshop. And I know that Natalie and Rochelle have two other questions um, for later on in the presentation, all about uh, natural yard care and a little bit more specific about your interests when it comes to natural yard care and water wise. So, all right, I'm gonna leave five, four, three, two, one. Looks like we've got about 85% of folks reporting. So I'm going to go ahead and end this. And one of the neat features of Zoom is that I can actually share the results with you. So you should now be seeing on your screen the results of that poll. Looks like split pretty evenly between folks hearing about this either on Facebook or through a workplace email. So that's um, really handy, really helpful for us to know. And it looks like there's a few other folks that put um, answers in the chat. So thank you. Thanks for sharing. I'm going to go ahead and close this poll. And um, the last thing that I want to mention is that this uh, workshop is being recorded. Um, we're going to post it on our Facebook page. We'll also send a follow-up email um, with a link to the video recording of this workshop after. Um, so if for some reason you have to step off, you won't have to miss any of it because you can access it via video probably in the next day or so. Um, so it is being recorded just so you know. And uh, with that, I'm not sure that I have anything else and we can maybe turn it back over to Natalie to start and I'll be uh, I should mention if, if anyone has any um, technical difficulties please let me know in the chat I'll be kind of in the background as Natalie is presenting um, kind of fielding questions and I'll interject occasionally to let Natalie know what the Q&A is looking like what the chat is looking like so any questions at all feel free to pop it into the chat so with that I think I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Natalie and we'll go ahead and get started learning all about uh, natural yard care thanks Natalie Thank you, Leah. All right, I'm gonna share my screen with you all. And we'll get started, great, okay. So I wanna echo everyone's welcome. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, and let's get started. So I want to first, oh, there we go. Um, first talk about why natural and water smart. Um, presumably everyone's here because you're already kind of on the bandwagon with this, um, but some reasons that you might want to do natural and um, water smart yard care, uh, it's better for your health, you could lower your utility bill um, by using less water, um, it's better for the environment, you're going to end up spending hopefully less time and less money on maintenance, um, and at the end of the day you'll grow healthier plants. So here's a couple of examples of what a natural and water-wise landscape might look like. Um, and these come from various places. The bottom two are actually from the Enviro House. Um, so at some point you can go there and check those out. The first thing I wanna talk about is soil. So soil is kind of the foundation of everything that you're um, gonna be doing here with your natural and water-wise landscape. Soil anchors plant roots. Um, it's the medium in which plants take up water, oxygen, mineral nutrients. Um, and it's really kind of like the combination of home and grocery store for your plants. They get everything um, from the soil. So soil is made of living things um, like microbes, like little bugs, worms, um, once living things. So broken down plants, broken down um, animals, uh, and then non-living components like rocks and um, other broken down little bits of non-living material. So all that together is your soil. 
Um, and the way that you take care of your soil and you nurture your soil, that is going to help you um, be growing better plants and also help you use less water. Um, so I have more information on soil. There's some, uh, some information on the internet and there's some links on the uh, TPU website that you can find ways to grow healthier soil. So one way that you can make better soil um, is by using mulch and compost. Now, mulch can be anything from wood chips to grass clippings. Um, it can be compost. Compost is a type of mulch. And what mulch does is it acts as a layer on top of your soil um, and it uh, allows the soil to regulate moisture and temperature better. It kind of creates this blanket. Um, it allows a difference of texture, so it adds more texture to your soil. Um, and in the case of compost especially, you're adding nutrients and, a, and you're adding them in a slow release way so that your plants can take them up as they need them. Um, compost specifically, um, you'll, you can look at the bottom part of the screen here, and this has some, um, some guidelines for how to add compost to different types of soils that you might have. So if you have a new lawn, you're gonna seed a new lawn, um, and you have, uh, these are kind of our more, um, our more common types of soil in this area. Glacial till is what I have at my house. That's more of a, a rocky mix, um, sandy soil, and then more clay soil. So you can, you can come back and look at these if you'd like to as you move on. Natalie, I have a question for you. This is Leah. Yeah, go for it. Can you talk just real quick while we're on the com topic of mulch and compost about Tagro? Is Tagro compost? Should people use Tagro? How should they use it? How does that fit into the mulch and compost world? Yes, absolutely. So um, Tagro is, you can get Tagro compost. Um, and yeah, it works. It's uh, just like, um, just like some of your uh, other types of compost where it's broken down material. Um, and you can use that to add, um, texture and add nutrients to your soil. And, and like other composts, it is a slow release. Um, so, and I'll talk about fertilizer in a minute, but that's one of the benefits of it is it's, it's a slower release um, than a synthetic fertilizer. Very cool, thank you. Awesome. All right. So let's talk about fertilizer. Um, so one of the things you wanna think about when you're using fertilizers is their mobility. So if they are highly mobile, they're gonna move through the soil really quickly. So your, your synthetic fertilizers, your more um, like your liquid fertilizers, those are gonna go through the soil really quickly. And one of the benefits of them is they give a really quick shot of nutrients. They get in there, they get in there right away, but they're gonna leave the soil really quickly and it's a really high dose all at once. So I like to think of it this way. If you are really hungry, um, and you really want a, a big Thanksgiving dinner, let's say. Uh, 10 Thanksgiving dinners put right in front of you is not necessarily gonna do you much good. But if you can space them out over time, you're gonna be able to actually eat all that food. And um, that's what a slow release fertilizer will do for your plants. It'll release over time so that they can take up nutrients as they need them. Um, compost is a type of slow release fertilizer, but you can, find synthetic fertilizers that are, that are slow release. You'll see that on the packaging. Um, and so that's better in a lot of ways, not just because your plants are able to take up more of that, but then you lose less. And importantly, um, you're not letting it leach out where it's gonna end up in the um, storm drains or uh, in the groundwater or somewhere where you don't want it to be. Um, Mostly, if you're gonna be putting fertilizer on lawns, you wanna put it on in the fall. It's just good practice. It'll allow the lawn to build up its strength. Um, and also, talk to your local nursery or your local um, landscaper um, and ask about what kind of fertilizers plants actually need. Some of them won't need any at all. Um, but you can use things like Tagro, you can use things like worm castings um, and things like compost to help add nutrients. And those are more natural ways of adding nutrition to your soil and giving your plants the things they need to grow. Natalie, I have two questions for you again, Leah. One um, 
came through in the Q&A while we're on the topic of it. Jumping back to soil, Angie yeah. wants to know, how do you know what type of soil you have? That's a great you have question. to guess. <laughs> uh, no, you don't have to guess. Um, so I, I had a little bit of that in here, but I, I took it out for time. So I'll real quickly, um, if you take some of your soil and you rub it around in your fingers, um, if it sticks together really well, um, and if it's a little bit uh, sticky and almost greasy, that's gonna be a heavier clay soil. Um, if you rub it around in your fingers and you can see um, the, the individual grains in there, those individual grains are sand that you can see with your naked eye most of the time. Um, and if water drains through it really fast, that's often a more sandy soil. Um, and in between those two is silt, uh, which is the medium particle size, but um, if you if you grab your soil in your hand, you kind of if it's really sticky, that's the more clay. That's going to be um, something that you'll want to watch out for because that'll hold water really well. Um, but often it'll hold it for too long and it'll get kind of bogged down. You can also, I believe, ask a master gardener. They might be able to help you with that. And if you just Google it, you'll, you'll be able to see um, perhaps like some YouTube tutorials that'll show you how to make a soil ribbon and see what kind of soil you have. A lot of what we have around here is what I was referring to earlier, glacial till. And that's where it's kind of a mishmash with a lot of big rocks and chunks in it. Um, that, that's what mine is here. Uh, but you can, uh, you can find some really good online uh, tutorials to show you how to see what soil you have. Sorry, I don't <laughs> that um, not to get too much commentary in here, but I would imagine that that's why it's really important to look for maybe, I don't know, native species, things that are well adapted to the soil that already exists. And I know a lot of folks in here are probably really interested in the natural yard care. And I would imagine that selecting, um, you know, natural plants and picking the right plants for the type of soil that you have would be especially important. So, um, and maybe you'll get to this in a moment too, but we did have somebody in the Q&A ask if we could name a few, um, you know, water-wise plants. So maybe you'll get to that later. So if oh, we yeah. have some ideas, I figured you would. And one last yeah. question on the fertilizer front. I hope this is a quick one. Um, yeah. Is it possible when you're talking about natural fertilizers to overdo it? Can you over-fertilize and do harm to your plants? Absolutely. And that's really the, that's really the, main thing for this goes for fertilizers and when I talk about pesticides as well read the label just I I know you want to just dump it all on there I do too if I see a plant struggling I just I really just want to like dump all the fertilizer on it once but fill it with kindness like <laughs> yes <laughs> that will not you will smother it um so read read the label read the packaging and and know what you are putting on to your plants um because Overdoing it might be even worse than underdoing it. So definitely, yeah, read the label, read the package. Um, and some fertilizers are specific to certain types of plants. So you have uh, fertilizers specifically for roses or for acid-loving plants like rhododendrons and blueberries. Um, and so if you want to get really specific, those are out there and they will say on the packaging, this is for these types of plants. Um, and, and those are really um, much more specific if you want to go that route and really get um, fine-tuned with it. And I, I recommend that, especially for food plants. Um, I, I like to go really specific on those. Very cool. Thank you. Sure. All right. So now what you've all been waiting for, let's talk about plants. This is why we all came. Um, so when you're planning and planting your water-wise garden, um, it's a great way um, to reduce your water footprint. And, and one really good way to get started is take out some lawn. Lawn is a big suck of um, water and of nutrients. And if you wanna just take out some chunks of your lawn and put something else in, that's a great way to get started. Um, you can go a little bit at a time. You don't have to take out the whole lawn at once. I'm chipping away at my lawn um, these days. So, um, less work, less fertilizer, less mowing. Um, think about it. So what plants do you want to use? Uh, first, let's talk about native plants versus non-native plants. So native plants are those that are um, adapted to our area and they've been living here for a long period of time. Um, those are going to be already ready to handle our drier summers and our really wet winters. Um, so native plants are a way to go. If you're not sure if something is native, um, 
ask if you're at a nursery or at a garden center, um, or you can easily just look that up online. Um, uh, often Wikipedia will say where plants are, certain plants are native to, even if you go to that page, um, something general like that. So uh, some examples I have here, um, bracketed on either side uh, on the edges are some uh, paint brushes, some native paint brushes. Those are real pretty. Those are one of my favorites. Um, and then I've got ocean spray on the top. That's real common. And vine maple on the bottom here. Um, really uh, good ones that'll adapt to a lot of different environments. Um, those are good ones. Um, and also, you don't have to use natives. There are a lot of non-native plants, ornamental plants, that are really great. They're drought tolerant, and they're not uh, noxious weeds. They're not invasive plants. Um, so just be sure to ask when you're buying plants um, how, how voraciously they spread. Um, but a lot of plants you'll find are really drought tolerant, even if they're not from here, um, and they don't require a lot of water once they're established. Um, that's, that's something you can look for. And there's a lot of great nurseries around this area. Um, so if you wanna go out to those and ask around, that's a really good way. And if you ask, if you're going out and asking for water-wise plants, for drought-tolerant plants, um, the nurseries will get that message and they, will, they can start to bring in more of those if people are asking for them. Um, let's see here. One thing I wanna warn you when you're buying plants is make sure you know how big they're gonna get. Um, I've been burned by this before. Um, often they'll have it right on the label there, um, but you wanna make sure you know, especially if you're planting it near any kind of structure, your house, um, other plants that you like and want to preserve, uh, make sure you know how big those are gonna get um, because that can really, um, really surprise you sometimes. Um, Another thing to do is put plants in groups that are, have similar water needs. So if you have a couple of plants that are gonna need water once a week, maybe put those together and then have another section if there's plants that need more water or less water than that. So that way you can kind of streamline your watering experience and you won't have to think about it as much. Um, also think about where the water moves on your landscape. So. Um, if there are any kind of depressions where water pools or anything like that around your property, you want to make sure that you know where it's going to be really wet sometimes and where it's going to dry out faster and plant accordingly. Again, with any specific species of plant, you want to ask, you want to look it up. Um, always, I will say it again, ask a master gardener. They're really helpful um, and they're able to point you towards resources even if they don't know the answer themselves. Um, the last thing I'll say about uh, planting and planning is uh, if you want to save yourself a lot of trouble, plant in the fall. We have pretty consistently wet falls here. So if you plant once the rains have come in, um, you're going to save yourself a lot of watering and a lot of fretting over your plants. Um, I've done some early summer plantings before and I, I worry all summer long and into early fall well it starts to get hot and it's dry and I got to be out there watering all the time. Save yourself the trouble, wait and plant in the fall. So what you're saying Natalie is it may not be water wise to plant right now even though we're all stuck at home or many of us are stuck at home and I know we're all itching to get out and, and do some gardening but you're saying maybe sure. wait until the fall and that's, a, that's more of a, a water conscious water wise way to do it. Sure. And, you know, I, I say this with all the, all the love of those that want to go out and do it right now. And I, I'll be honest, I'm planting stuff now, too. I'm not a lot of things, but sometimes you just really want to get it in the ground. And if you have it already, you should get it in the ground. You might as well, rather than having it languish in pots for however long until the fall. Um, but yeah, if you want to save yourself the trouble, wait till fall. Great. Thank you. All right, and then I have one more, one more picture of just a nice mishmash of some native plants I found uh, out in the Green River watershed where I work. Um, just, just some nice ones out there. You'll see some lupins in there. Those are really easy ones. They're great, and it's more paintbrush. Again, my favorite thing. Um, all right, so now let's, let's get into watering wisely. So when you're thinking about watering, you wanna be always asking yourself, what do my plants need? So in order to know what they need, you wanna know, are they native? So are they adapted to this type of environment? You wanna know if they're established. So 
even native plants, even drought tolerant plants, if you're getting them from a nursery and they've been in a pot, you're gonna need to give them some time to get used to um, and get kind of spread out in their new environment. So for the first, especially for trees and shrubs, at least I would say the first couple of years, you wanna really pay attention and make sure that you're maybe babying them a little bit um, because they need to get established and kind of get their roots situated so that they'll be able to um, take up those water and nutrients on their own without as much help from you. Um, so if you're looking at a lawn or a, sorry, at a yard that's already sort of established, a landscape that's established, um, you're probably gonna have less watering needs than something that's brand new that just got put in. Um, and then you also wanna think to yourself, are these drought tolerant? Um, so if you're asking yourselves these questions, you're thinking about what do these plants need? And then you wanna think about what are the site conditions? So what's the weather like? Has it rained recently? Um, if, it's, if it's been a really good heavy rain recently, you probably don't need to water. Um, it, it sounds so simple, but uh, again, even I, I will just be in a panic about some new plants I put in and wanna get the hose out there and start watering them, but if it just rained, they're probably okay. If it's sunny and hot, maybe keep an eye on them. Maybe look and see if the soil's moist. So that's another really good, easy way to check and see if you might need to water is if you go out and you dig down in your soil a little ways, often the top layer will be dry, but just underneath it, you still have a lot of moisture there. And again, I'll come back to think about compost, think about mulch. Those are ways that will keep moisture held in on these hotter days and help regulate that, um, that moisture for your plants. And so you won't have to water as often if you have some kind of mulch covering that soil to reduce the evaporation when it gets really hot. Natalie, I have a question. Sorry, <laughs> keep it. Yeah, in no, go ahead. These questions are coming from our chat, but some of them are, are popping into my head too. But <laughs> you talked earlier about drought tolerant plants. My yeah. first thought when I hear that is like, well, we don't really live in a drought area, do we? We get quite a bit of rain. So will you just touch on really quick the importance of like what, like what a drought tolerant, why, why a drought tolerant plant is important in our, our area? Sure, I, that's a really good question too. And um, depending on what kind of, you know, uh, circles that you run in, I guess, you might not hear the term that, that we often talk about in the water industry, which is our droughty summers. So yes, we get, a, we get a lot of rain here, absolutely. But then there's that really beautiful period of time, usually what, July 5th to right when school starts, <laughs> that is, um, that's really hot and it does get droughty in the summers here. So we often will go for long stretches without rain, the temperatures ramp up. Um, and so plants that can tolerate that um, are gonna be less, um, less hindered by that sort of environment. So yeah, that's an excellent question. We, we don't have drought for nine months of the year, but it's those kind of three months that are sandwiched in there um, that are really tough for plants that need a lot of moisture and a lot of water. Um, and if you, again, if you go back to talking to folks at the nursery that you're buying from or at the garden center, um, or again, the master gardeners, um, they can help kind of navigate that. This plant maybe will do better um, through that summer drought season and uh, they can tell you which ones will and which ones won't. But it, it doesn't have to be, it's not just cactus that we're talking about here. That's what pops into my head. Well, I know you've got a lot to cover, so I'll stop asking questions unless they- No, no, this is good. <laughs> this is good. I'm, I'm used to interacting with people, so I'm, I'm struggling with the, the web. Yeah, it's okay. It's a learning curve for us all. So, all righty. All right. Okay, great. So, again, thinking about what your soil conditions are, what's, what's happening in your environment. So in general, these are just your, your basic watering wisely tips. You want to water deeply, less often. This is going to help the roots grow deeper um, and it's going to increase their capacity for time between watering. And this goes for your lawn, this goes for um, your ornamental plants. You want to water deeply, less often. And really you can you can also use the soil check for this one too. You can kind of dig down in there and see how deep the water that you've put on has permeated. Um, so it's really, um, 
just think about it as you're giving them a nice long drink. Um, you want to water for lawns, you know, you can do just uh, once a week, even in the less scorching times. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more specifically about lawns in a minute, but um, definitely watering really deeply. Let that water soak deep down into the soil, um, but less often. And that will allow your plants to get capacity to be able to last longer. It'll do them good as well. Um, next is uh, letting the top one or two inches of soil dry out before watering again. If you have plants especially trees and shrubs, um, ornamental landscape plants that have deeper roots, um, that water is going to be permeating way down and you can let the top bit of soil dry out before you have to water again. Um, and then this one is much more for your benefit than, than the plants necessarily, is watering early in the morning or late in the evening. Now that one you might think why, uh, but think about if you're watering in the middle of the day and it's really hot out, you're going to lose a ton of that water to evaporation. So especially um, if you've got a really pressurized spray coming out, a lot of that is just going to go right up into the atmosphere. And so you want to water early in the morning or late in the evening when it's cooler and you'll get a lot more of that water to stay where you want it, which is on the plants, um, rather than evaporating right away. So those are those are some really basic, and again, this goes for this goes for any kind of planting that you've got early in the morning, late in the evening. That's the time to water. So now let's talk about the specifics of watering. So let's talk about irrigation. Um, first, I'll talk about more automatic in-ground type uh, irrigation. So things like pop-up sprinklers. Um, and rotors. So with those, um, if anybody's got one, uh, a lot of people have them for their lawns. Um, they might have them in other places. Um, there's a couple of really easy ways to see how efficient that is, um, that's working. The first one is turn it on, run the cycle, and uh, make sure that all the sprinkler heads are pointing the way you want. Um, I'm sure we've all seen somebody watering the sidewalk. Um, and in addition to being wasteful, um, you're gonna waste water, you're gonna have a higher bill, um, and that water is not going on the plants that you want it to go on. So make sure that your heads are pointing the way that you like. Don't water the sidewalk. Uh, the other thing is look at the pressure. So um, if you can see this, this poor dog here, um, I have often seen, especially with the, the pop-up sprinklers, you'll see them coming out and the pressure is so high that it's basically a mist. And a lot of that water, again, that's all being lost um, and it's not going on the plants that you want. Um, so there are ways to regulate pressure. Um, a lot of folks, uh, if you have an in-ground system, you have uh, somebody that maintains it, talk to them about pressure, especially if you see something where it's the pressure so high that it's misting um, because that's, that's not what you want unless you're doing something really specific, like you've got some special orchids that need misting or something. But for your lawn, you don't want the mist. You want droplets of water. Um, and in general, this goes for sprinklers or hand watering, whatever kind of watering you're doing. You really, the point is to make sure the water is applied in such a way that it is gonna soak into the ground and it's not gonna run off. So if it's being applied so quickly that it's turning into a river and flowing off, even if it's not pointed towards the sidewalk, it ends up going on the sidewalk or going someplace where you don't want it. Um, that's also, that's not working for you. You're wasting water, you're wasting money. Um, so you, you want to make sure that the water is being applied slowly enough and directed so that it's not going to run off. It's going to end up soaking into that soil. Um, if you have a timer on your sprinklers or on, on any kind of watering system, um, you might consider switching to a water efficient model if you don't have it already. Often these are called smart controllers. Um, we have a rebate on those at Tacoma Water, which Rochelle will talk about briefly. Um, and even if you don't get a water efficient model, um, think about when you're going to need to water. So if you have yours on a timer, think about adjusting at that throughout the season because we have times during the kind of middle spring, early summer time when you really don't need to water that much and then especially not 
the same as the really hot times. That's gonna have to be a different watering schedule because otherwise you're gonna be watering ground that's already wet. Um, so if you have any sort of in-ground thing with a controller, just think about um, how often you really do need to put water down um, and think about adjusting those times. Manual watering, hand watering, um, that is a totally okay to water. It's a little more time consuming, um, but it also gives you time to get to know your soil and get to know your plants and check in on your plants health, which um, we can talk about in a second during the pesticide section. Um, but manual watering is great and the same things apply. You know, you wanna pay attention, you wanna make sure that the water's soaking in, it's not running off. Um, and uh, you can really, uh, make sure that you're um that you're doing a good job there and kind of check in as you do it um, so take that opportunity if you're hand watering kind of check in on your plants um, and then i i do want to talk about drip and micro irrigation but i'm going to do that from a different location um, so for now i'm gonna take off and have rochelle take over did you want natalie i know we have a poll um, asking people how they water plants at their home. Is now the time to do that? Sure, yeah, let's do that. All right, well, you're transitioning. I'm going to go ahead and put a poll up on the screen right before Rochelle um, talks to you for just a minute while Natalie is uh, getting a change of scenery. Um, yeah, like, uh, like Natalie said, there's a lot of different options for how to water plants at your home, so I'm very curious, and I know the rest of us are too. Um, how do you water plants at your home? A pole should have just popped up on your screen. We want to know, do you use a sprinkler? Do you use a hose? Um, do you let the sky take care of it? How do you, um, how do you water at your house? So um, please take a second and answer that poll question and maybe it'll help Natalie kind of guide the second part of her conversation and, and let people know uh, how they're watering. I know, um, at least in my neighborhood, sprinkler systems are not super common, I don't think, in Tacoma. We just get so much rain, but um, that's not the case everywhere. It looks like a few folks are saying that they water with a sprinkler system and a controller. Um, a lot of folks taking, uh, taking the same way that I do, which is just either letting the sky take care of it or walking around the house or your yard with a hose and a spray nozzle. So we'll give about uh, maybe 20 more seconds here on this poll if you haven't already answered. And again, if you have some kind of creative method that we did not put as an option, please let us know in the chat. We, uh, I think I can speak for folks at, uh, at the city in Tacoma Power that if you've got some new creative way for watering and watering especially wise and conserving water, we want to hear about it. All right. Oh, just you. About... Go ahead, Rochelle. I just so I do, I do want to hear about it. I'm <laughs> nice. Okay, we've got about 80% of folks have responded. So I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll here in three, two, one, and I'll share results. So it looks like uh, by and large, I think if you can see this on your screen, 68% um, of folks responded that they just walk around their yard with a hose and a spray nozzle, doing it that old fashioned manual way. I know for me, that's always kind of a, kind of a meditative practice to walk around the yard with my hose, but um, there are certainly more probably efficient ways to do it. Um, other folks said they just let the sky and the rain take care of it. Yeah. Um, I also am noticing in the chat, we have a couple of folks who are talking about um, catching water that might be otherwise wasted, like at the end of the day in a water bottle, or um, John is talking about uh, the water that flows as a shower warms up and catching that and using that to water house plants or even going outside with that water. It's also great to see. For sure. Um, and while Natalie's getting set, thank you for all that. I did want to take a second to share a new, um, uh, yep, here we go, it's my first Zoom webinar. I'll get there. Uh, a new uh, rebate that we have available at um, for Tacoma Water customers. And that is, it's, uh, this is the, flyer that's hot off the press. You can see the printer's marks. This will be going into our July and August bills. So if you get a paper bill, um, you will get this in an envelope along with your bill. Uh, this announcement about our rebate, um, this is a rebate for uh, irrigation controllers, specifically for water sense labeled smart irrigation controllers. So those of you who use 
any kind of timer or controller as you water your yard, this might be a great opportunity for you to upgrade to a smart controller. And when I say smart controller, I mean a weather-based controller, one that, uh, here we go, yeah, there's my face. Uh, so we mean um, weather-based, so one that either has Wi-Fi and talks to local weather stations, and so it takes into account the weather that's happened in the past, as well as weather forecasts for the future, and it adjusts the watering that can happen uh, in your yard based on weather that's happened and that will happen. Uh, some of uh, smart controllers also uh, have a little plug-in weather stations that you can attach to your roof, and then that is measuring the actual weather, the temperature, the solar gain, and the precipitation at your house, and so it knows exactly what the weather has been at your home and then can adjust your water accordingly. So Natalie was talking a lot about maybe you want to think about turning your water up or down depending on and how often you water. Uh, and if you have a smart controller, then you don't need to do that. This, uh, these will do all of that thinking for you. So um, there's more information at mytpu.org slash smart irrigation. Uh, and it looks like, um, unless we have any questions about smart controllers and our new rebate program. I, we have one, Rochelle. Um, mm -hmm. Just uh, John wants to know about, uh, he thinks that the city gave out his adjustable spray nozzle that he uses. Is the city or TPU still um, handing out those um, like water smart um, like nozzles? I know, Thank you. I know you had a fun name for them. <laughs> yeah, the spray nozzles, yeah. Um, and we were, we, um, last year we gave out a number of the seven pattern spray nozzles and we did purchase those and intended to give them out again this year. And we have had to put that program on pause because of the current health, uh, pan the current pandemic and health situation, public health situation. So we are trying to figure out how to make those available to uh, folks uh, in a safe way for us and for all of our customers. Um, if that is something uh, that you're interested in finding out more about, um, knowing uh, from us when those are available again, we intend to make them available again. We just haven't quite figured out how we're gonna do that. Um, but I'd be happy to take your information and let you know when those are available again. Cool. That's good to know. And Rochelle, there's a couple other questions, but they're in the chat. So before, you know, in the, in the effort of time, maybe I'll let you answer the chat questions yourself. And in the meantime, it looks like um, Natalie has transported herself to another area of the home That's and she's great. now outside. I'm so glad, Natalie, that it's such a nice day outside to be sitting out. And I think uh, you've got some... Um, uh, some outdoor tips and tricks. So if you want to unmute yourself and then um, folks, if you're viewing on your on your uh, computer, I'm going to go ahead and make Natalie's video the spotlight. So Natalie out in her yard should be the biggest face on your screen that you see, um, or you can double click on her face. But without further ado, Natalie, where are you and what are you looking at? Hi, everybody. I'm back. Um, so I am out in my yard here and I just wanted to really quick show you how you might be able to use drip irrigation in your home. So Drip is really a, a really simple process. Um, it uses little um, drippers like these, um, and they put water down really slowly. So this one puts down four gallons per hour. This one puts down two gallons per hour. And I have this little guy that puts down just one gallon per hour. And it's kind of like a Legos type setup. You have a long um, main line that's that's basically just a big hose and you can connect that to a hose bib um, and into that you can stick directly these little drippers or you can um, use some microtubing like this um, and you can stick a dripper in the end and you can connect this microtubing to your main line. There are also really handy newer innovations like um, this microtubing, and it's it's kind of hard to see, but there are um, at intervals here, here and here, and as you go, there are little drippers built into the hose itself. So for this one right behind me, I have, you kind of see here, I have a ring of this microtubing with the drippers built into it around a plant so that the water goes evenly to the roots. Um, and that's just a really, really easy way. You can just turn it on for an hour or for two hours, leave it, you come back, and that water has just dispersed really slowly into the soil. And so the roots are able to take that up. 
Um, some advantages of drip are you can put it underneath mulch like this, um, so you won't even see it, and then the mulch will hold that moisture in. Um, and most of the drippers and any other kind of um, materials you'll buy these days are, um, they're really great about having filters built in so they're not going to get clogged by the mulch bits that are around. Um, and it's all really cheap. You can get a, a drip kit um, at your local hardware or garden store for around 20 bucks. Um, you can get the individual pieces themselves for just really very cheaply, a couple of dollars here and there um, to put that together. Um, and the best part is um, you can take it apart and rearrange it if you need to. So if you change up your landscape a little bit, you can take that apart, you can um, put it back together any way that you like. Um, we have on the EnviroHouse How To YouTube channel uh, a specific video about drip irrigation and there are a lot of other really great um, videos online of people showing you how to put it together but it is it's very very simple um, so with that uh, I'll see actually Leah are there any questions on that before I transition back um you know I'm not seeing any right now but as you're transitioning I will mention to folks go ahead Natalie I think we're all set if any come in while you're while right. you're magically transporting I'll let you know um, we do have something that we didn't get to earlier that's a little bit more of uh, curiosity, wondering what folks are watering. Um, I don't know if you can hear, that's my drum roll because it's time for another poll as Natalie is moving back into the house. Um, we want to know what types of plants you're watering. Um, I'm going to go ahead and launch this other poll. Are you mostly watering your lawn? Are you doing food and garden or fruit trees? Um, what is it that you're watering? I mean, I think I can speak for um, for Natalie and Rochelle when I say like, it probably depends on what kind of irrigation you choose um, based on what kind of plants you're trying to water. So select all that apply. Maybe you've got fruit trees or, or a garden in addition to watering your containers. I know at my house I've got um, container gardens but also some raised beds and for the first time ever have a lawn that I have to take care of. So um, that changes a lot on how, how, and, how and where and, and why we water things here. So I'll just give maybe 20 to 30 more seconds on this poll. Looks like about 66% of folks have uh, have responded. And again, I want to remind everybody that if you have um, a question, looks like Angie is asking, what is the name of the Enviro House YouTube channel? Um, Angie, I'll put a link to it in the chat. I'm, I'm not sure it's easily found just by searching the name. I think it's called City of Tacoma Enviro House, but just to be sure, I'll be sure to put a uh, link in the chat so that you can, can quickly and easily access that. And we'll also send it in our follow-up email. Um, all right, I'm going to end the polling. It looks like pretty evenly across the board here. We've got most people saying that they're watering potted plants, containers, or hanging baskets, um, with a fair number of people also saying they're doing food gardens. I know, um, you know, there's a few familiar faces on my attendee list, our attendee list I can see that um, are really actively involved in the, the urban um, urban gardening and urban foods in, here in Tacoma. So I'm really happy to see that so many people are are doing containers and um, you know potted plants and container gardens. Um, so I think I'm going to hand it back over to Natalie. It looks like Natalie's transformed herself back into. She commented earlier. It looks like she's in the Honey I Shrunk the Kids movie. There, sitting in the grass. You look like you're about the size of a grasshopper. So I'll hand it back over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Leah. I'm going to share my screen again. Go back to where we were. Okay, so that was irrigation. And let's move on. Oh yeah, there's my slide to go outside. So uh, I'm gonna really quickly, in the interest of time, walk through pests. Um, there's lots of ways to deal with pests. Here are some ways that you might deal with pests. Um, you can manually or physically remove them. That's like picking them out yourself um, or spraying them off with a hose. You can use uh, natural pesticides. There are varying degrees of natural um, and there's a really good EnviroHouse how-to video on that as well. Um, biological controls are using the predators of pests to get rid of or to tone down the numbers of pests. So uh, ladybugs, for example, releasing ladybugs, that is an example of a biological control. Um, and then you also have things like synthetic chemical pesticides. Um, so 
I will say really quickly for um, synthetic pesticides, you've got advantages and disadvantages. Advantages include that they work really fast um, and that they can be used safely if used properly. Um, disadvantages include um, they promote genetic resistance in pests, so the more you use them, the less effective they'll be. Um, they also kill the enemies of pests, that is the things that are trying to eat your pests, will also be killed often by pesticides. Um, they can be pollutants, they can harm wildlife and people, and they can also cost a lot of money. Um, so there's certainly pros and cons. Uh, I will say the same thing with pesticides that I said with um, Fertilizers, that is, read the label. That's another thing where I see people just dousing um, their lawns or their driveways with chemical pesticides and you really, really, really want to read the label if you're going to use those. Um, Natalie, I'm going to give a quick um, plug because I, I think it's really important to touch on this, especially because this workshop is, you know, natural yard care. And I think a lot of folks on here want to focus on the, you know, natural remedies and pesticides. And um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that, you know, at the city, we're really concerned about um, uh, chemical pesticides and the impact that they have on our, our pretty delicate marine um, environment. I know our stormwater, um, stormwater management team is very concerned because a lot of people in Tacoma don't realize that what flows from our streets and our sidewalks and our lawns, you know, into our storm drains goes directly to Puget Sound completely un untreated. Um, so if you're using some of those, um, those synthetic chemical pesticides, like you said, they might be really effective at killing the pests and getting rid of the, the nuisance in your yard. But think about that full cycle of where those chemicals and those pesticides are going. And, and most of the time here in Tacoma, if they end up in our storm drains, they're going right to Puget Sound and, and it proves to be a big problem. So um, appreciate that you mentioned it for sure because it's, it's certainly an option, but I know, you know, putting on my City of Tacoma hat, we certainly encourage folks to look at the, the natural pesticide options. So I'm so glad that you included that list of those here. Yeah, and I, I really want to focus on what's called Integrated Pest Management or IPM. Now, a, a lot of the folks on this webinar may be really familiar with this. Some of you that aren't, I'm going to just go through the basics. Um, there's a lot more to learn about IPM um, and you can find classes on this. You can, again, you can find um, videos on this, but uh, this is a really, I think a really robust way to deal with pests. Um, and a lot of the, a lot of the um, benefits I think you get with IPM are one of which is prevention. So preventing problems before they start. You put the right plant in the right place. You keep healthy plants. When you're buying plants from a nursery or garden center, you make sure they're healthy before you bring them home. Um, you wanna just make sure that you're cultivating healthy plants and those are less likely to get stressed and be prone to pests in the first place. Um, you wanna be on the lookout always for pests. When I was talking about hand watering, you can kind of be checking on your plants the easier, it's gonna be much easier to check on your plants and, um, and uh, catch pests early if you're out there a lot. So monitoring your plants, making sure you catch, catch pest um, infestations at the early stages, they'll be much easier to control and you won't need to use harsher measures um, to deal with them. In terms of options, you wanna make sure that you first identify the pest you're dealing with just because it's on your plant doesn't mean that you've caught it in the act. Um, often, again, predators of pests will be on the plants looking for those pests so they can eat them. Um, so you wanna identify your pest, and then you wanna set thresholds for tolerance. So how much of a pest is enough that you're gonna take this action? So say at a certain point, a pest uh, infestation is small enough, you can deal with that with manual removal. Slugs, for example. Slugs are a big problem in my yard right now. Um, and if I catch them early enough, I can just pluck them out by hand and I don't need to use any kind of pesticides, natural or otherwise. Um, if they get to a certain threshold, then I might wanna move into using um, a natural pesticide that I've already pre-chosen. So uh, I like to use beer to get rid of slugs. I just put a little dish out with beer in it and they they go in there and I guess just drink themselves to death. Um, 
So Some slugs are partial to IPAs or porters or pills. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just use the cheapest, the cheapest beer I can buy. The, We're not the picky. <laughs> about now works really well, I will say. Um, so, so you identify certain levels of pests, and at that point, you will then take a certain action to deal with those pests. At that point, you then watch it. Again, you want to keep an eye on it. You want to be a, an active participant in this. You want to see how that treatment's doing. And maybe it gets down the pests down to a level that you're comfortable with. You're never going to have a completely sterile outdoor environment that's free of any critters. There's always going to be something around. So you want to just think to yourself, okay, what am I, what am I comfortable with here? Um, and then you kind of just continue on that threshold. Now, some pests have published thresh thresholds um, that you can use. Um, you can find those online. Uh, the Wazoo Extension Office out of Puyallup, they have a lot of really great pest resources. Um, you can also, again, talk to a master gardener. Um, and so often what the, um, the program that you create with IPM is that you're using the least harsh methods first and you're catching things early so that you don't end up even having the urge to use any sort of uh, harsh synthetic pesticides. Um, and so you can monitor, are things spreading, are they declining? Um, you want to, again, uh, just try to make sure that you're killing the actual thing, that you, the pest that you want out of your garden, or not even killing it, just removing it somehow. Um, so IPM, a lot more to learn there. Check out other resources for that. Um, Wazoo Extension, Master Gardeners, for sure. Um, and then with that, I'm going to really quick talk about lawns. So we have some time for questions. Uh, lawns. Lawns are ubiquitous um, in our area. Um, and they're, they're not necessarily the worst thing in the world. Uh, a lot of people like having lawns. I prefer to have a little space for a badminton court. It's great. Nothing wrong with lawns. So um, there's some lawn uh, best practices for being water wise and being natural with your lawn. Um, and those are, first of all, one inch of water per week. That is what lawns will need. You can measure that really easily with whatever watering method you're using. If you have a little can of tuna or of cat food that is empty, that's about an inch tall. So you stick that on your lawn, use whatever watering method that you are using, whether it be sprinklers or if you have one of those back and forth sprinklers that you set out there. Um, and the length of time it takes for that tuna can to fill up with water, that is an inch. That's the amount of time it takes to put down an inch. So one inch of, per week of water for lawns. That will help them water deeply um, so the roots get deeper so they won't need water so often. Um, there are less water intensive um, varieties of turf, so you can buy water wise turf. Um, sometimes you might have to ask around for that. Ask at your local nursery, ask at your local garden center. Um, if they don't have it, you can always look on the internet. Um, but there's a lot of varieties that are available that use less water, specifically bred to use less water. Um, and then lastly, for mowing, um, Leave your grass clippings. If you have a mower that will let the grass clippings fall as you go, leave them out there. That's mulch. That's going to recycle nutrients back into the soil. It's also going to provide a little bit of a um, barrier so that the soil can maintain more moisture and temperature control. Um, and make sure that your blades are sharp. That'll be better on your grass um, and it will allow it to grow more fully and have a clean break when it does cut off. Um, and lastly, just um, don't cut more than one third of the height off of grass at any one time, at any one mowing, um, because that'll stress it out and then you'll need to have more watering and you might have um, greater chance of pest control or pest problems, um, things like that. So one inch of water per week, less water intensive varieties if you're putting in a new lawn um, and then leave that leave that grass out on the lawn um, if you can those clippings all right um, before we do questions i think we have one more poll leah is that correct um you know or did we do them all 
I think we did them. I think, uh, oh no, I'm sorry. We, well, we have one more, um, but I, we talked about this before. I think I'm going to wait until after the questions to do this after all, only because the question is kind of about, did you get all your questions answered? Did it meet your expectations? So I'm going to actually hold that until the end. But um, I do have one more question that came through in the Q&A. Um, and then what I want to do for attendees is this is the portion in these workshops where we do like to, if you're comfortable and you want to ask a question verbally, please use the little raise hand button feature and we have the ability to unmute you if you have a functioning microphone. Um, you can ask a question in real time to any of our panelists about anything that was covered today or anything that maybe you're still curious about. So I encourage you to please use the little raise hand feature um, on your, there should be a button down near the bottom of your screen. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to get us all back so that it's the four of us um, back on the screen. Janda, your video should be working. We can get our faces up here again. Um, so while we're waiting for folks, if they want to use the raise hand, um, we did have a question. I know pesticides and chemicals um, are maybe discouraged or should be kind of a last resort or at least we at the city like to encourage them to be kind of a last resort. Are there any pesticides or chemicals that are outright illegal to use in Tacoma that people should know about that are just like, you're, you're breaking a law <laughs> if you use them? I mean, and Rochelle or Janda, feel free to answer these questions too if these don't have to be just for Natalie. I will say I don't know the answer to that question. Um, That's okay. I bet we can find out. Um, yeah. Um, in the meantime, I do have a question you mentioned right there at the end. This has been a point of contention between my husband and I. You do want to leave your grass clippings on the lawn. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I see. Correct. I thought, I thought, I thought that thatch in a lawn, which I know is a bad thing, was basically kind of created if you left your grass clippings on the lawn. But how, how is it beneficial or why is that beneficial? Well, it does all the things that mulch does. Um, and as it breaks down, so the, the grass has, uh, the grass behind me here. Um, so think about the top layer of this. Um, if that ends up in the, um, on the ground, it's, uh, it's not woody. It's pretty, um, pretty moist. It's probably gonna break down pretty fast. And then those, um, those nutrients are gonna be recycled back into the soil so that the grass that is still alive can then use them. And you get those temperature and water um, regulations that you would um, with adding a mulch to say like a landscape bed because they'll kind of add that that barrier between the soil and the um, and the air. Okay that makes some, sense. Some people don't like the the look of it and I, I get it if you're if you're going for like Versailles here that's totally by all means you know take them up but for a natural um, and water-wise, uh, you're going to get more benefit by, benefit by just leaving them. And then you don't have to haul them around and try to find some place to put them. That makes sense to me. Um, Janda, I have a question for you, actually. But I'm going to, first of all, because um, one of our attendees, Lori, um, who's actually a colleague of ours, is, is was kind enough to answer a question talking about DDT, which, of course, has been banned for 40 plus years and illegal for 40 plus years. Um, but it's still around. So Lori suggests investigating any commercial products by investigating their safety data sheet. So I would imagine that kind of along the similar lines of Natalie, you said, read the label, learn about the product you're putting on your lawn, um, be sure to check out whatever safety data sheets or safety information comes along with it. Um, Janda, if you want to, you're muted. If you want to unmute your microphone, I have a question for you. Um, I know earlier in the chat, um, somebody um, asked about if the Enviro House was open right now, and I said, unfortunately, it's not open to visitors, but if and when it's safe to do so and we can all congregate back at the Enviro House, could you just give a quick, I know there's a lot of them, a quick overview of natural yard care um, options that are on display at the Enviro House? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, there's a lot to see right now, um, even though we're not open. Um, the whole the driveway is blocked off so that people can't even get in to walk around the grounds on their own. I'm hoping that that's going to be accessible within a few weeks. Um, we're still debating when we can get back and how we'll receive visitors. Um, probably no on-site workshops for a few months, so we'll continue the virtual. Um, the grounds are broken up. Um, there's a lot of signage with descriptions of what's there. Um, there's micro 
climate zones like Natalie was talking about. So trying to plant things that need the same kind of water and light um, are examples. Um, <clears throat> most, well not most, but a lot of the native plants that are designated for our area are there on display. Um, and I did put a note in the chat that if people are interested in that, you can find a lot of information on the Washington Native Plant Society website um, or email me, ehas at cityoftacoma.org, and I can send out some lists. But there are um, some really attractive plants. We're trying to get a new website developed, so we will have a lot more gardening and plant information and identification on that website when that gets done. Very cool, thank you. Um, two more questions, I think maybe one for Rochelle and then one for Natalie. Um, Rochelle, does either um, Tacoma Public Utilities or, or otherwise that you're aware of, are there any incentives to replace lawns with um, Xeriscape, is that what it's called, Xeriscape? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is, and there are not incentives for that right now. Um, the, the only rebate that we're offering uh, with regards to landscaping is um, with irrigation controllers. Mm -hmm and helping people reduce their water use uh, through just watering the right amount for the plants that they have in their landscape. Um, and I also wanna mention while I have the floor, um, another resource at the Enviro House when it's open again are is the display of pieces of an irrigation system and some uh, information about ways to build a good irrigation system that's effective and some information about controllers as well. So that's another nice resource there at Enviro House. Very cool. Yeah, of course, you know, it's such a challenging time right now with things being closed and social distancing requirements and um, so many great resources out of the Enviro House that I'm, I'm really looking forward to being able to get back there. And, and same with TPU and, and rebates and incentives and things like that. I mean, I, I've only worked for the city for almost two years, but um, I was so impressed and amazed to see the number of resources and customer incentives, not just for, you know, landscaping and irrigation, but just for energy and conservation programs across the board that TPU has. So that's been, been really cool to see. And there were rebates and, and incentives for things I didn't even know there could be rebates for. So um, I encourage you again, even though now is kind of a challenging time for everything, be sure and keep an eye on that. Um, one more question from Constance, and maybe this is a question back to you, Natalie. Constance wants to know, back on the topic of grass clippings, are they a good mulch for your vegetable garden? Yeah, you could do that. Now, you want to make sure there's no seed in there, though. I oh. draw mulch this spring, and I regretted it very soon afterwards because the straw, although it looked very dry and dead, had grass seeds in it. So be careful if it's just the, the grass leaves themselves, but if the grass is flowered, I would, I would not do it. But otherwise, yeah, it's, it, it would be great. It would be really great. Very interesting. I didn't think about that before, but you're right. You don't want to plant a new lawn right over your vegetable gardens. That defeats the purpose. Um, well, very cool. I don't see anybody, nobody has raised their hand, so I'd like to encourage you if there's anybody else that has any last minute Q&A. Oh, we do have one. Uh, I spoke too soon. Patrick has raised his hand. So Patrick, I'm going to go ahead and um, unmute you, allow you to speak, and then I think if you uh, you're unmute yourself, if he indeed, indeed did mean to ask his question. Patrick, can you hear us? Can we hear you? Do you have a question for us? I can hear us? you. Great, we can hear you too. What's your question? Question is, um, any discussion about uh, replacing a lawn with clover or micro clover that's uh, designed for the Pacific Northwest? Yeah, that is an, I'm so glad you brought that up. So we um, did a little bit of an experiment with that at the Enviro House a couple of years back, <laughs> Janda, if you'll recall. Um, but yeah, that's another really excellent way to do it. Um, and I'm trying to think of, I want to say we got some of the clover from a local. It was Garden Sphere and it was a blend that they created with, um, I think it was Dutch white clover, I believe, that was mixed with a grass seed um, designed for the Northwest. Um, the, the one thing you need to be careful of is that if you don't want the clover throughout your lawn, it does tend to spread because we set up five little plots with different kinds of um, grasses and they all have clover in them now. So it works it's really great well. use. Yeah, it works really well. 
yeah. stuff works really well, sometimes works a little too well and gets in places you don't mean it to. But yeah, my neighbor right across the alley planted some clover earlier this year in his back. And it's been amazing to watch that stuff grow. And um, he planted it for that very reason, Patrick. He planted it because he wanted a, an alternative to um, to grass in the little patchy area that he had. And he, he walks around barefoot on it all the time. It looks great. <laughs> I will say too that one other benefit of clover is that um, clover is in the bean family, which means this is going to get a little technical here, but it fixes nitrogen. So it, it takes nitrogen out of the air and um, accumulates it. Um, and that's a vital nutrient for plants. A lot of fertilizers have a lot of nitrogen in them. So it actually helps improve the soil itself um, because it is able to do that. So even, even good uh, beyond the not being grass. And can you add, um, does clover use less water? Does it, uh, you, you don't have to mow it because of its height? What are some of the sort of basic advantages of clover? Definitely. Um, so both of those things, uh, this, this one in particular, I believe, Jana, that we used um, was a really uh, drought tolerant variety. Uh -huh. and, um, and yes, it is lower, so you don't have to uh, you don't have to mow it necessarily. Now, one thing to think about is when it flowers, um, you might get a lot of bees on there. <laughs> so if, you, if you're running around on there as someone who has accidentally stepped on a lot of bees in their day, um, you want to, might want to give it a, give it a run with the mower for that. Um, but yeah, it's much lower growing. It's not going to get out of control um, and high like grass does. And if you don't mind the flowering and the bees, it's good pollination. That's great. Um, I have one more question, I think, maybe to wrap it up, and that is um, maybe getting into talking about more vegetable gardens, which I know wasn't the main topic of this, but um, it's just something that's come to my awareness in the last couple of months, and that's diatomaceous earth as a natural pest inhibitor. Um, I had some ants attacking my cabbage plant, and somebody recommended that I use diatomaceous earth to try and prevent those ants from eating my cabbage. And it seemed strange. It seemed like I was dusting powdered sugar all over my cabbage, and but it seemed to work. Do you know anything about diatomaceous earth and how and when and where can you overuse it? Is it a natural yard care technique? I, I can answer a couple of those questions. Um, I have pretty limited um, use with it, but I know that it works well on soft bodied insects because it'll kind of like, it's, it's so fine, um, but it's sharp. So it kind of like cuts them up. A, a gruesome death, I think. But um, uh, I'm not sure what the specifications are um, for overuse or what exactly um, you'd want to do, but that would be another um, thing I bet you could find Master Gardeners or um, Wazoo Extension would have some information on that. Very cool. Good to know. Yeah, I use it. It seemed to work. I've heard it's not harmful to humans. You don't want to breathe it in too much, but it's it's generally not harmful for humans and, and or pets is the other thing. It's not harmful to pets, but yeah, it gets on those little soft-bodied insects and kind of wreaks havoc, but um, well, anyway, I think I'm going to do this last poll here because then I think I'm going to hand it to Janda. She's got a few more things um, to wrap up, but we just want to know kind of, um, again, this is only our second um, uh, virtual EnviroHouse workshop that we've done. We're still learning how these work. Um, we're still learning how the best way to communicate and engage with the community members are through this medium. So thank you for joining us. Um, I want to know how well this workshop met your expectations. I know Janda and Rochelle and Natalie want to know how well this met your expectations. You know, um, we always want to know if people got their questions answered. Um, so please let us know. We've got about half of the people have responded here, um, most saying that did make their expectations. So well done, Natalie and Rochelle and Janda. Um, we're asking people if there were questions that weren't answered, uh, please put them in the chat or you'll also be as everyone that's on this web webinar right now was um, registered uh, for this workshop. So we'll be sending a follow-up email afterwards with some links. If there were questions that weren't answered, we'll do our best to address them there. We'll also include all of our contact information. So if you have questions about the irrigation incentives for Rochelle or more questions about slugs and what kind of beer they like, you want to ask Natalie, <laughs> <laughs> feel free to just let us know, you know, those pertinent questions. So um, feel free to let us know. I think we've got um, a handful of folks have responded to this poll. So I'm going to go ahead and end.
Um, and glad to see that most of the folks that responded said it totally met your expectations. So well done. But um, of course, I, I know I can speak for myself when I say we're always still looking to improve. So if you have feedback, ideas for new workshop topics, um, please let Janda know, please let any of us know, and we'll make sure that we can uh, get something on the calendar, especially during this summer when we're, we're not able to gather in person at the Enviro House yet. So um, Janda, do you have any closing, uh, closing things you want to talk about? Um, just a reminder to check um, the Enviro House website on the workshop page in the next couple days and your Facebook page where we will post the next webinar. Um, as I said, we're doing July 1st, we're doing um, herb gardens and um, how to use and plant and process um, um, garden herbs. We are working on getting one together on heat pump systems on heating and cooling with ductless and whole house heat pumps. That will be in mid-July. Um, the end of July we have one scheduled for um, how to, it'll be a little bit on dehydrating, um, but how to, recipes on how to um, make up um, lunches and breakfasts and snacks and so on for backpacking. And then we have two or three others in the works um, coming up and um, and we are doing those um, how-to videos. We just did one on composting. We're doing one tomorrow on um, container planting, and we have more topics on those in the works too. So if you have ideas, if you've been to other workshops and you want to see those created as a webinar or um, a how-to, please let us know, and we will do our best to meet those needs. Yeah, thank you, Janda. I gotta say, um, you mentioned um, uh, preserving. Shout out to Hal Mang. Hi, Hal. I know you're on this webinar. Looking forward to hopefully hosting one of these with you in the future. So um, yeah, like Janda said, keep an eye out for upcoming workshops and stay tuned. Uh, keep an eye on your, your email inboxes for our follow-up email. But um, Natalie, Rochelle, unless either of you have any closing thoughts, I think we could uh, wrap it up for the day. Thank you so much to everyone that joined us and we hope to see you at the next Enviro House workshop. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.